Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that. And uh, children are dismissed at this time for Children's Church. I don't know who we got. Okay. Open your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians, where we're in uh, chapter three. The last two times we discovered Paul's teaching on three different types of people in the world. Now we also I informed uh, you. I, I like giving these updates because we are growing really fast as a world in the human population. But we hit the eight billion mark. And we're above that. But out of that 8 billion people, there's three types of people we could, according to Scripture, put in one of three types. The first type is the natural type, uh, a person who is not born again. The second type is a spiritual person who walks in the Spirit. And, of course, the, the third was the last one that we looked at is the carnal person. A carnal person in Scripture is considered as a Christian uh, who is not walking in the spirit, but rather walking in the flesh. And uh, so that person is ruled by the flesh and is not yield to the control of the Holy Spirit that is in them. Now, some members of this Corinthian church here were overoccupied with the works of flesh. It's very interesting. Uh, things like envying and strife and divisions, those types of things were pretty active there in that church in the first century. Uh, they were babes in Christ, uh, they were called, uh, only able to endure milk or the basic truths concerning the uh, Christian walk and not growing spiritually because of their failure to put into uh, practice the very word of God. Uh, because of their failure to submit themselves to the Holy Spirit of God so that they would walk according to his word and have the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to work in us with the aid of the Holy Scriptures. The two never conflict with one another. Both of them work together for our good as Christians, and we should be able to rejoice in that, uh, knowing God has this worked out for us so that we can live a full, happy Christian life and uh, not worry about being carnal in our walk with the Lord. Paul is identifying these issues to help these church members to walk in the Spirit. And as we listen to them, we ourselves can learn that it is important for us and possible for us to walk uh, in the Holy Spirit. Now, in uh, chapter 3 and verse 9, it says this, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's uh, building. And so they were to be working together, not in division, not at each other's throats and, and all the other things that were going on in the flesh there at this time. It didn't mean this was everyone in that church, but a great population within that church, a good percentage factor, if you will, uh, had these issues going on. You know, you know you've know, heard that saying, it takes one bad apple to destroy the whole bushel, right? Well, in a church, the same thing can go on. One person can cause a lot of discord. Uh, in this case, it was more than one. It was a group of people, and this was catching on to the rest of the church. It wasn't a good scenario at all. But uh, look at the caution that uh, Paul gives them in verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as uh, by a fire. And so uh, this is interesting because those who were working, you know, on the side of the flesh, those carnal Christians who were walking in the flesh, uh, they were building hay and stubble and, you know, the idea here is things that would burn up. They wouldn't stand the test of God's fire. And uh, so they were going to be burned up. But those who are walking in the spirit, their fruits, their works uh, would stand that test because they were grounded uh, in the Holy Spirit and in the Holy Spirit working in and through them. And so uh, rewards would be there for them. And that's what Paul is saying. This is his caution. Uh, if any man's work shall be burned, and uh, you look up a little 
more in verse 11 there. Now, let me see here. Oh, how about, uh, it's uh, verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, meaning spiritual things, as he walks with the, with the spirit, uh, it says uh, stones, wood, hay, or stubble, the things of the flesh, as somebody who's in the flesh, they're working uh, with things that are not spiritual, but they're works of the flesh. And so he gives a good caution uh, to them. Uh, he says uh, they'll suffer loss, uh, if it's burned, but the person themselves will be saved. You know, Paul says when he starts out in this chapter, he says, brethren, that's what he calls them in, in verse 1, and I, brethren, uh, he, here he's saying that, you know, you're going to lose all these things you thought were so great that you got your, all of your mind, all of your attention, all of your joy from rather than the things of the Lord uh, who saved you. Uh, you'll be saved, but you're going to lose a lot uh, all those things that you built upon are going to be burnt up. And so today in a message that I've entitled the temple of God, and this is the, going to be the first part of this, we find Paul teaching how carnal behavior negatively impacts the temple of God and has personal consequences as well. It's a, it's a wonderful chapter of a, a church in the first century, a good, a good thing for us to look and study and be able to say, you know what, maybe I personally have to make an adjustment to that. Is our church uh, like this? And we ask those kinds of questions. That's what scripture does. It makes us ask questions about our world and what's going on here and now. What we need to take away from this is anything that we think is even close to being a carnal Christian uh, to have nothing uh, to do with that. Uh, and so we're going to learn about the personal consequences, but also... Uh, Paul opens their eyes here, identifying Christians as the temple of God and having the Spirit of God in them. And so it's a fascinating uh, a chapter here that we're looking at. Follow along with me as I read from chapter 3, and we'll begin in verse uh, 16. Uh, verse 16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, he shall de uh, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Uh, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. Let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, I just pray now, I ask that you would bless this reading of your word. Help us to glean from this things that help us to be Christians who have totally embraced you and submitted ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God, that we might bring you glory and that it might benefit us in our own lives and that we would be uh, blessed uh, in our own lives so that we can uh, go about in our, our daily walk uh, in the, the Spirit and be a blessing to others. And Father, we give you the praise, we give you the thanks, and just trust your working in our hearts here this morning as we look at this passage of Scripture. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In these first two verses I read here, you may have not, you may not known this, but in the uh, the English here, these English words, ye and you, uh, that are used, uh, for example, verse 16, know ye, not that ye. Uh, those words there are plural words in, indicating more than uh, one person as meaning a group. If I said, it's, you know, if I said to the congregation this morning, ye all, what I'm talking about, you all, it's everyone, it's plural. And uh, it's, it's plural in the Greek. The, the word you in, is interchangeable for us in the English. We say it all the time. Hey, you. Uh, or, you know what I'm talking about? Hey, you. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Hello. Thank you very much. I got a yes. And I'm going to go for another bit over on this. No, okay. 
so that's, you have to understand it. And I'm bringing this to a, a, a highlight because you have to understand when we see a ye in, in scripture, what it means. It, it's, it gives you the correct uh, rendition, and I really like that. Uh, in the KJV that we use, it properly translates the Greek words. And uh, when it does so, it makes it easier for us to understand who's being talked to. Here's some, in my notes, I wrote down a few uh, words. Ye, you, your, yourselves, and so forth. Those are the plural uh, words. And then you have the singular word as well, and it has its distinctions as, as uh, we'll find here in Scripture. But words such as thou, thee, thine, those are the singulars. Now, Pastor, what's that mean to me? It sounds crazy. I'm getting confused. Well, don't think on it too hard. It's distinctly different. Uh, in our Bibles, it's, it's situating who the, a group is being talked to or a person. And, and so that helps us. It's just not always a you, because that you will make you do more research uh, and trying to find out who's, who's being talked to. And so what does that mean? It means that Paul is writing to the Corinthian church body and not an individual. Oh, okay. Think about that as uh, I continue here. Not just one person, but the whole body here when he says um, um, ye or yours. It's really interesting because most of us have heard this verse here preached before, this one uh, verse here. Verse 16, uh, ye are the temple of God. We've all heard that before. And I think that most of us, when we have heard that from the pulpit, or some of you may have uh, walked away thinking to yourself, I'm the temple of God. I was not saying that. It's saying us as Christians, when we join together as a local body of believers, as a local New Testament church, we are the temple of God. Oh, yeah, God's Holy Spirit is in us, but we're not the temple of God. The temple of God is this corporate group who comes together here to worship God, the church body. That's who he's talking about when he says, you are he wasn't talking to them uh, individually. That's why it's important to make that distinction uh, of, of this yees and the these, if you will. Some people don't like the, the these and the yees. They say, it's so confusing. No, it's not. It's clearer. You just have to understand that. And once you do, as you read through Scripture, uh, it opens your mind uh, to a lot of these little things in here that help us have a better understanding of the Bible of the Bible and what it has to say to us. And so he also says in chapter 3, verse 9, look there for just a moment, for we are laborers, I've already read this once, together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye, which is everyone there that he's writing to, ye are God's a building. It is a spiritual building. That's why we're all supposed to work together. That's why there shouldn't be any division in the church, and I'm not saying there is right now. I'm preaching what was happening in the Corinthian church. But I'm also hopeful that if there's any seed of doubt in somebody's mind, any seed of contention or divisions, you come talk to me so we get straightened out. Because those things can turn ugly fast. And uh, so Paul is writing them to correct something that he had found in this uh, church here. He cared about the church. He wanted them to know uh, how he felt about this and how he could help them to get turned around. And so you and I, as a part of this church body here, are the temple of God uh, here. We could call this, you know, the... Uh, Mancelona, a uh, temple of God, and we call it the Mancelona Baptist Church. We could call it the Mancelona Baptist Temple of God. And you can throw in temple. Perhaps you've heard of other churches. Some churches are called Bible Temple, God's uh, a temple, you know, the idea of the church being the temple. And the Bible makes it clear that each believer is sealed with the Holy Ghost, and that's something we rejoice in all the time, um, when they're saved. And so the Holy Spirit in each believer is what makes the local church a spiritual house. Is everybody in here filled with the Spirit? I don't know. 
but I know that the members are. I believe that they are the ones, the folks that I know and use uh, that have been coming regularly. Yes, I believe a good portion of us all have that Holy Spirit in us, but not everybody does. One thing about God is that you know when Christ came to die for us, the Bible says, "Whosoever uh, should believe on on Christ, uh, believe in their hearts." Uh, that God raised him from the dead, you know, when we confess Christ with our mouths and believe that God raised him from the dead, that doubt shall be saved. And if you've done that after recognizing that you're a sinner, you can be saved and the Holy Spirit can, you can be sealed with the Holy Spirit. And when you are, then you do become uh, a member, if you will, of the local church after you're baptized and you become a, a member of the local uh, a church here. You become part of that dwelling, if you will, that temple of God, that building of God, that spiritual building. Listen to these uh, couple of verses here. Ephesians in chapter 1, Paul said, uh, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed and were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Here's my promise to you. You're going to live forever. I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in you and, until that takes place. I'm going to give you a down payment, and that down payment is the Holy Spirit. Well, thank you, God, for the Holy Spirit. Amen? And, uh, and so it's a promise. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Uh, don't grieve the Holy Spirit who is in you. This church was grieving the Holy Spirit because those carnal Christians were creating havoc in the church because they were causing divisions. They were saying, well, I follow Paul. And the other one said, I follow Apollos. And then they were going back and forth, you know, who are we going to follow? Are we going to listen to what the pastor of this church says? Or are we going to listen to all these other smart men? Who are we going to go? And Paul said, wait a minute. <laughs> We're all a building of God, a spiritual building working together for God's glory. There is no divisions here. You know, some pastors, they can say, well, that church over there and that church over there and say all that they want about these other churches. But, you know, if we're preaching and teaching the word of God, we have to realize that we're on the same team. Now, we may not be like-minded with everyone else, and that's okay, too. But those that we are like-minded with, we're, we're on the same team. And so it's not a competition. Even some pastors get that mixed up, I believe, uh, at times. And they think, is, you know, they, they want to huddle around and keep their church safe from, you know, all, all the other churches around or different things, different fears like that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.19 says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? own. Oh, that's a good truth. We are not our own. Uh, I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Just go to the right. A couple books. Right after Galatians, you'll find Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 19 it says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. I'm part of it. Thank you for that. This is a good passage of Scripture. It just, it just coordinates or cooperates with 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, where we're looking. And then there's another one I, I really like. Um, it fits perfectly here. 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn there for just a moment. If you need a Bible, there's one... The one in front of you, you have the hymn now, and then the smaller book is the Bible. And you can follow along with us so you don't think I'm making these things up. 1 Peter chapter 2. And look at this in verse 5. Ye also as lively stones. How many of you are lively stones today? Hello. 
Just me? Come on. Go ahead, stretch your hand up. Nobody's watching. Aha, gotchas. All right, we're lively stones. Uh, and some of you might think, well, I'm dry bones. Well, <laughs> let God breathe into those bones, okay? Make you a lively stone. Uh, but that's what he says, verse 5, ye also as lively stones are built up, up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Isn't that a good passage of scripture? Why are we here? Why do we come to church to worship God? For these very reasons right here. And we're to do so in unity and together not always giving pushback, not always, you know, trying to, you know, this isn't a place of competition like the world is, okay? Uh, the world out there, you, you got to climb the ladder, my friend. Uh, you got to climb that ladder to be somebody. Here, we're all equal when we're in Jesus Christ, and we work together. We have our different roles and things, and don't look at the role of the pastor as some, you know, CEO of the company. No, I don't even like those kind of comparisons, I just want to be the preacher here and what God has called me to do, the pastor of this church. That's all I am. I'm just another preacher, as some have said, and that's okay with me because I'm doing what God wants me to do. What's he wants you to do in this church? What, what part of the building are you? We know that Jesus is the cornerstone. What stone are you? Where is your lively stone at within this church body? Where's God plugged you in? Think about this. Now, each of us have our place in the church body. It's fantastic to me, and, and it's such a wonderful thing to know that God allows me to be part of his marvelous work. Jesus said, I will build my church. And Jesus is active here at Mancelona Baptist Church. He is trying to continue a work here, and it's been going on uh, for over 50 years here, continue this work of reaching people for Christ, for teaching them the, the scriptures, all of it, uh, all the scripture, all the counsel of God, and winning people to the Lord, seeing them baptized, seeing people saved, and, and living uh, Christian lives, strong Christian lives for the glory of God. That's our calling to do that. And uh, th I'm, it's just a marvelous thing when you think about it in this church temple that these things have taken place. My wife and I were going over some of the history of the church here as we were organizing some things. And it was just so wonderful to see the, the different pi uh, pictures of people throughout the time, not only that since we've been here, but before that as well, to see how it has all worked together and God has been doing things here at the church. God is still in, in Mancelona Baptist Church. He still wants to use this church body for his glory. What we have to recognize is it takes some humbling on our side, and it takes some realization on our side that that includes us. And when we realize that, God can really use us. Paul wanted these Corinthians to understand the bigger picture concerning their church, to help them get their eyes focused on God and off of Apollos and, and Paul and all the other different uh, uh, men who were in their lives at that time preaching and teaching the word of God. It was all about God. It wasn't about these other men. When we keep our eyes on God, just like in a marriage, I like this illustration, but you got a husband and a wife, and, a, and if they're always going at each other, they just get further apart. But if they focus on God, both of them, and work toward pleasing God, they suddenly get closer as they, to each other as they get closer to God. That's how it is with the church. We have a, you know, a members in the church here, and uh, if we're always looking at each other and conflicting with each other, we're getting further apart. We're not we're not coming together as in one or in unity. And, but when we get our eyes on God and the things of God and putting them into practice, then we draw closer to God and one another as we do that. And, and that's what scripture would have us uh, to do. Now, Paul, he was trying to help them get their eyes focused on the Lord, as I said. That carnal activity that was going on in there was something hard uh, to break. And uh, Paul was out to do that. He was out to stop it. Now, we have to understand better what the holy temple of God is. Uh, let's see what Paul says here in verse 3 and, and verse, or chapter 3, I'm sorry, 
in uh, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians. Just the first part. If any man defile the temple of God, well, <laughs> well what's going to happen? Well, God's going to destroy him. Uh, do you know what it means to defile? How, how can any man defile the church? What is he talking about here? Uh, well, when you defile something, it means you waste it or you spoil it by any process. In this case, it would be those works of the flesh. Uh, and it corrupts and it destroys. It's a simple uh, statement. If anybody defiles God's temple, God is going to destroy him. I thought to myself, oh my goodness. You know, I don't have time to be getting involved in, uh, you know, sowing discord among the, the church members, something that God hates. I don't want anything to do with that. I want to be rejoicing as a Christian and daily walking, loving God and, and loving one another, as the scripture tells us uh, that we should do. Um, and so, you know, if you're a carnal Christian and you're involved in those kind of things, you're still going to be saved, but you're not going to get any rewards when you get to heaven, is what Scripture says. It's all going to be burned up. But if you're a believer, well, let me back up. As a carnal a believer, uh, you know, all your things are going to be burned up. They're going to be destroyed. You won't be, but everything else will be. Some people don't like that. Bap that Baptists say, once saved, always saved. But it's true. How could it not be true? The Bible repetitively teaches us eternal salvation. And uh, so some people say, well, no, I don't know. If they, you know, if they're going to get all that stuff burned up, they're going to get it burned up too. No, that's not what the Bible is saying. It is saying their works in the flesh are going to be burned up. They themselves will be saved. We read that here. Uh, so, yet so as uh, by fire in verse uh, 15. Now, this got me thinking about those Corinthians. Were they defiling God's temple? Well, Paul seems to think so. And scripture kind of says that. So I'm leaning toward, yes, they were. Uh, I believe, uh, you know, apparently the answer is yes. But how were they doing that? So we can make sure that it, we stay away from that. First of all, uh, by not laboring together with God in a holy manner. Turn back to chapter 1 for a minute. In verse 11, it says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Uh-oh. Paul found out. Then over in chapter 3, in verse 3, he says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? See, he, he's calling them out on this. And so it's evident that carnal works, the wood, hay, and stubble, in, in verse 12 there, uh, in the temple of God, have personal consequences to them. Whew. How do we get out of that? Well, you pray to God and ask God to forgive you, get things right. That's how you do it. That's what they had to do. Uh, Paul knew what they needed. Uh, Paul doesn't say that a Christian will lose their, their salvation, like I mentioned, for being carnal, but rather some of you are going to answer to God in this life while on earth, uh, especially as we um, give our, our uh, personal account to him at the judgment seat of Christ. Do you remember that Bible story about the man who was... Um, having fornication with his father's wife. That was a terrible thing. I mean, the Bible reveals all kinds of terrible things about human nature, but that one there was just kind of, you know, something that sticks in your mind. But as I thought about it, I was reminded that happened to this church. This is the church that happened. It turned with me over to chapter 5 for a moment. Chapter 5. See, Paul wasn't done pointing out issues here. Look what he says here in verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. 
In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, end my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This was a carnal work this man was doing. And when Paul said, you know, the Gentiles, you know, you know that would be... That would be terrible if the Gentiles did it, and yet somebody in the church was doing it, and it was a carnal uh, activity. And so he's calling them out for that. The man was a Christian and yet living a carnal life here on earth, openly in the temple of God, and the church was unconcerned about it. That's frightening as well. Eh, oh, okay, that's all right. You know, I know a lot of times when I... I go out and, you know, I'm with family and we'll, we'll go someplace. We, may, we might be out eating or we might be in, you know, one of the shopping stores or something. And, you know, somebody will hear somebody talking and or they see us and they say, hey, how you been? And we'll start talking with them for a while. And they start talking and, you know, they'll say something that happened, uh, you know, with this person and that person and how terrible it, it was. And, and then they just kind of throw their hands up and they say, well, everybody's doing it. No, they're not. <laughs> uh, who says that? Well, a lot of people. Well, everybody's doing it. What does it matter? Uh, you know, who cares? Who's going to remember in a thousand years? I, and they just kind of wave it off like it's nothing, uh, like this church was doing uh, here. Uh, and so Paul, he told them uh, that they didn't even care. They didn't mourn. They didn't grieve. They just went, eh, what's it matter? We'll get through all that. You know, somebody else can take care of that if it is an issue at all. I don't think it is. And you get the picture, I think, here. Uh, and so carnal works, the wood, hay, and stubble there, um, Paul says you're not going to lose your salvation. However, you're going to have to answer for it to God. And God's going to deal with you. Um, and it happened here at this church, this one incident uh, here. I thought it was, that was a, a pretty bad thing there, but nobody mourned. And so, my friends, we ought to mourn over such things. That's what I'm getting from this when these things happen. We ought to mourn over such things. Anything that would de defile or spoil, uh, you know, the temple of God, uh, it, it doesn't please uh, the Lord uh, whatsoever. It, we don't want anything to tarnish a Mancelona Baptist Church here, which is a temple of God. And it must be considered unpleasant to us. If it's not, then we're joining the likes of the first century church when they were in the midst of having troubles. You know, this particular man did go on to be restored later on. Paul told him to be, bring, you know, you should forgive the man. Forgive him. You know, and if we are just preaching, you know, do's and the don'ts and all that other stuff, we really are, really are not exercising much grace here in the church. We have to exercise grace in these situations. We're all human, right? We have to exercise grace while not um, um, conflicting with what Scripture says. The Holy Spirit in us will help us as we look at Scripture to be the kind of graceful people uh, to help our church be not only a hospital, helping people with spiritual um, issues to be healed or restored or whatever the situation is, but also to uh, give encouragement, to give uh, counseling and all the other things that we need to have as believers so that we can work together and grow together and carry out the work that God has called us uh, to do here. I want to uh, conclude our message this morning just about there on time um, and say that you and I should not deceive ourselves uh, in any way glorying in men and the wisdom of the world we need to glory in the Lord and what he has in store for us and what he has done for us already and be willing and, and able and wanting to serve him here at this church and one another in this church as well. The Bible commands us the two greatest commandments, the first one being that we should love the Lord God with all our heart, mind, and soul and our strength, and the second one being that we should love one another even as ourselves. So we've got a whole lot of loving to do and just keep on doing it. We want to glorify God here. And I'm thankful for those of you who uh, 
agree with what scripture says and follow it uh, here in this place, helping to keep this church going the way that God would have it to do. Let's give him uh, the praise. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I do your, ask your blessing upon it. Help us, Lord, all of us, to watch our uh, mannerisms as Christians, not only here in church, but in private. Or when somebody comes up to us and, and starts uh, talking about a brother or a sister in a negative way, or the church, or, or in the, our deacons, or the pastor, or our church member, whoever it might be, help us not get caught up in that stuff. But help us, Lord, uh, to be positive to those people, to be kind and, and uh, to be gentle with them, but teach them Scripture and the truths of Scripture and let them know that we're going to hold to what the Bible says for us to do. Lord, we just love you today. We thank you for your word. I just ask that you'll help us to uh, consider these great truths and pray to you for your help to carry them out. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. <clears throat> and turn in your hymnals to number 306. This is an invitation time if you'd like to come up front and pray or you need to speak to the pastor about it, anything. Uh, please feel free to do that at this time. 306. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me God's word is preached and he's preaching to you. You need to listen to the Lord. Let him have his way. That's why we come here, to, to follow him. Linda, play one more verse. You can close your hymn notes. Just take a moment to think about the Word of God and what was said this morning. Thank you. 
fruits that the Holy Spirit has, but one that I'm thinking of and praying for you if you have, is that fruit of long suffering, gentleness, and goodness. As you go uh, today, let that fruit there manifest in you. Think of long suffering uh, with others and situations in life. Think of the gentleness of Jesus Christ in you. Let others see that. And think of his goodness as well. All for God's glory. Let's go ahead and ask these blessings and turn and pray together. Father God, I do thank you for every soul that is here and ask your blessing on, on them. Lord, let your words uh, stay in our heart. Help us to embrace them and love them, uh, knowing that you are our Heavenly Father who cares for us, who, uh, who is our comforter and, and gives us everything that we need. Lord, help us not never to abandon you and to all our deeds, but to cling to you. For I pray in Jesus' name.